Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, seek His aid, and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evils of our actions. Of some of Allah guides, none can misguide. And of some of Allah misguides, none can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah. I don't have no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad is a slave and messenger. To proceed, very the best of talks is the book of Allah, the Quran. And the best of guidance is the guidance of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace and blessings be upon him. And very the most evil of all matters are the ones innovated, for every newly innovated matter is an innovation, and every innovation is a misguidance, and every misguidance is in the helper. Today is the second class regarding a new book which is al tasfiya wa Tarbiyah in which I will conclude the life of the Imam Al-Allama Sheikh Muhammad Nasir al-Din al-Bani rahimahullah and it will start as well in the book itself just before I start have you managed to get a copy from the internet? yes? you haven't because I have been sent to me uh, as a, an, an email from somebody um, so I've got the book which is on PDF file. You need to have the book so you can go through it. Who hasn't got the book? Put your finger up. Uh, I have uh, at the moment, if somebody just takes for me inshallah, for fresh memory, I have it on PDF file, the English copy and the Arabic copy as well. So you have the English one which has been photocopied. This is only for the class, you use it. So please, uh, you're welcome to have one. Um, it's important to have the book, as I said, because we're going to go through it and we're going to make notes. First of all, this book uh, is a lecture that Sheikh Al-Bani, rahimahullah, had given about more than 40 years ago in Amman, capital of Jordan. And most of the lectures of Sheikh Al-Bani, if they are written, are to be uh, the lectures that are given by him. If they were to be written, there would be books. Rahimahullah ta'ala. To conclude the life of the Shaykh al-Albani, I would like to shed some uh, light upon some of the things that happened with this Shaykh and the Imam. I remember what Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he said, عِنْدَ ذِكْرِ الصَّالِحِينَ تَنْزِلُ الرَّحْمَةِ Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of the great scholars, he said, and this is adapted by most of the scholars, whenever we mention the righteous people, then a rahmah from Allah, the mercy of Allah will descend down. And also, Ahmad ibn Mahram, great scholar, he said, I used to stay or keep the company of Abu Mas'ud al-Razi in the Asbahan market. So we have mentioned the virtues of Sufyan al-Thawri, a great imam, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, Sufyan al-Thawri, Sufyan al Uyayna, all of these are great scholars. So Abu Mas'ud, he said, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive for us mentioning the virtues of Sufyan al-Thawri. Abu Ala al Ma'ari, a poet, regardless of his biography himself, but he made a poetry. قال, he said, Jamal al Ardi Kanu fil Hayati wahum ba'd al Mamati, Jamal al Kutbi wa Siyari. He means that they were these people who are the righteous people, the scholars, the beauty in the land when they were alive. And after their death, they were the beauty of the books and the biographies. So they were beauties, whether they were alive or whether they were dead. Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, the muhaddith, the scholar, which is, you call it muhaddith, the mufassir, a great scholar, Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, he says, مَا نَحْنُ فِي مَنْ مَضَى إِلَّا كَبَقْلٍ فِي أُصُولِ نَخْلٍ طِوَالٍ Like, we compare, and Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, he's a scholar. Compared to those who are scholars, he's mentioned the scholars, that he show his humbleness and as well, to show that the distance between him and the, the, ones, the ones who preceded him. We are just like the seed compared to the long palm tree. So we're nothing. Ibn al-Mubarak, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak was a great scholar as well. 
every time that the companions or the followers have been mentioned, he comes in the era just about before Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, Allah Mubarak, he says every time that the scholars are mentioned or the the uh, companions are mentioned, he said, لا تعرضن بذكرهم مع لا تعرضن بذكرنا مع ذكرهم ليس الصحيح إذا كم إذا مشى كالمقعد. That is, do not mention ourselves, do not mention our names. When their names is mentioned, it is true that the person who can walk, it is not like the person who cannot walk. He is disabled, so he's comparing himself which is disabled to the person who can walk. And it was said as well a long time ago. لولا البخاري لما راح مسلم ولا جاء. If had it been for the Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, Muslim would have never been the scholar that he is because he's a student of Imam al Bukhari. And we say as well, had it been for the Sheikh al Albani, لما بيزنا بين الكفر والإرجاء. ما بين ما بيزنا بين الخروج والإرجاء. That is, had it been for the Sheikh al Albani, would never distinguish between what is the difference between خروج and between إرجاء. رحمه الله شيخنا. We just go to some of the stories that mentioned regarding the Sheikh and some of the stories regarding his students as well. Because we haven't touched anything about the students of the Sheikh Al-Bani, Rahimahullah. Have I mentioned the story of Sharif Ibrahim Al-Hashim in his book, Juhud Al-Allam Al-Albani, from the, uh, the efforts of Sheikh Al-Albani advising those people who were from Jama'at Al-Takfir. Jama'at Al-Takfir, they were looked like at the moment of the uh, Hijrah. Takfir, same thing. Muhajibu, same thing. Okay? They were at the time of the Sheikh Al Albani, and they used to make takfir upon the leaders and even upon the Sheikh himself. And the Sheikh, he had a number of debates with them to show them that they've got nothing, no knowledge. So, so many of them had rejected the kufr, alhamdulillah, and rejected that methodology because of the effort of Sheikh Al Albani. Anyway, this Ibrahim Al Hashimi, Al Abir, he had made a book regarding those debates that took place and he said in that book that when I met the Sheikh al-Albani for the very first time it was in a lecture in one of the mosques in Jeddah and it was 1409 <coughs> and that's about 25, 24 years ago and he said I was stunned and astounded by the Sheikh al-Albani in that meeting and because of his immense knowledge and his way of debating and of way of he is delivering the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu And then he said, I paid a visit to the Sheikh 1414, less than 20 years ago, in his house in Amman. And there was some series of knowledge, some of them from Kuwait. They were asking the Sheikh some question regarding politics, uh, involving in politics and how to do with the manhaj and the da'wah. So the Sheikh gave an answer which was about more than 30 minutes and he was looking at something on the table and in that answer he did not even hesitate a bit. He was just like talking and talking and, and not even stop. So after he finished I said I went to the table just to see what was he looking at. He was reading from a piece of paper and he was reading from nothing. It's just to show you his memorization. Sheikh Al-Bani, he had a student called Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al-Bani. He died less than a year ago. I don't know if you heard about him or not. It's one of the great sheikhs which I paid a visit in his house, Rahimahullah. He was a person who used to study underneath Ahmad Kuftaru. Ahmad Kuftaru was a Sufi person at the time when the Sheikh al-Albani was in Damascus, in Sham. So he mentions how he had moved from the Sufi to the Salafi. And the Sufi and the Salafi is just like 180 degrees, by the way. And that is why the Sufis, they would hate Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah so much. Because Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he is the one who had exposed these people. And if you remember, that at the time when uh, there was the Khalifa there at that time, and uh, those people had boasted, which is the Sufis, the ones who are poking themselves with the, uh, you know, the shish kebab, see, okay. okay, they put a poke, they are metal rod metal, a uh, rod of metal, uh, and then they will poke it there as well. And they said as well they could go in the fire, and they put themselves in the fire, and nothing will burn them. So, uh, Sheikh al said he had challenged them. He said that these people, uh, they are liars. 
And uh, that challenge was brought forward before the Khalifa. And the Sheikh Sal Taymiyyah, he said, before they go into the fire, first of all, I have to have to have a wash, a ghusl in al khal. Al khal, which is the acid, or they call it the vinegar. If they wash themselves in the vinegar, and I will go with them in the fire, and we'll see who is the liar where the fire is going to burn him. And you know that these people, they cover themselves with a special, specific oil that would protect their body from burning. So when they put the vinegar, that vinegar will remove that sort of substance, and then they will be exposed to the fire, and the fire will not, of course, distinguish between the liar and the truthful one. So they did not uh, respond to that challenge, and they were defeated. Also about the rod, he said, I don't want the rod to go into the stomach and to the, you know, this going to the stomach, by the way, is the, uh, to a story of Sheikh al-Albani himself as well. That rod as well, it could be, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a sport, which has been as well played even by, have you seen the Buddhists from the Chinese people? They walk themselves with the rod coming from there, there, and they know that the rod will not penetrate those intestines, but the intestines are, uh, surrounded by something which is uh, it's like slippery and this is how the doctors as well when they want to stitch something they know that that needle will not poke for example that intestine so they know that for a fact so Sheila Santanyi to challenge them uh, with a needle not a rod I don't want a rod I want a needle but I want that needle to go into one of these three places either in the eye the pupil itself uh, and there is no there's no sport about this sir uh, or in the spine, yeah, that's a killing. Because the Shri Sami by the way, he knows about as well physical things to do with the body. He was a doctor, he was a chemist, he was a scholar, he was a scientist. Or in their testicles, yeah, the tubes. <laughs> and they couldn't as well, they were defeated as well regarding this issue. So, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Bani Rahimahullah, when we read the Sheikhs, he said, and I'm going to talk about his student Muhammad Ziyad, he is mentioning what the Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Bani had said uh, regarding the first meeting between Sheikh al-Bani and his Sheikh. He said that my Sheikh, which is Abdul Rahman al-Bani, had went to Damascus, Dimashq, 1951. That makes it about uh, 60 years ago. And uh, he was uh, with Dr. Muhammad Amin al-Musri, that is a Sheikh, and uh, he had met the Sheikh al-Bani so our Sheikh, he says, it was the biggest favor that this doctor, Muhammad Amin al-Musri, had done for me, that is to make me to meet the Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah. I went and I saw the Sheikh al-Albani, and I have seen some scholars with him, and I have seen him that he was concerned about his tasfi and tarbiyah, purification and cultivation, which is our topic. And he was so precise about his time, the time is for him is so precious. And he says as well that the first book that we have studied with him was Lum'atul I'tiqad for Sheikh Muhammad Duhab Rahimahullah. He used to recite the book, read the book, and then those phrases from the Imam Muhammad Duhab, he used to elaborate and explain them, just like we're going to be doing as well with the Sheikh Al-Bani's lecture. We're going to be reading and explaining, inshallah. So the, we used to come with the brothers to learn the Quran and study the Quran and then at the same time I used to study with my Sheikh Ahmed Kiftar, the Sufi and my, my uh, lesson is after Asr with the Sheikh Ahmed Kiftar where Sheikh Al-Bani's class was in my house because I asked Sheikh Al-Bani to put it in my house after Maghrib so as soon as I finished my class after Asr I run, there was no uh, transport at that time available so I used to run I used to find some of those people already had arrived before me in the house, in front of the house. I would apologize to them, and then we would start with the lecture with the Sheikh al-Albani. Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah, he says that I was affected by him. He did never talk to me about Ahmad Kuftar. He never talked to me about the Sufis. He never talked to me, but his, his convincing way, that is, is his power in convincing the person in front of him, uh, it's so immaculate. And the Sheikh al-Bani that stunned me with him, that he is his chastity. Uh, he would never put himself in a lower position. If somebody wants to give him money, he will not take it. 
Whereas he had compared him with Ahmed Kuftaro, if he gives a class, after the class he says, you know if a, if a, if a doctor came to cure you, wouldn't you give him money? And it's like, you know, a hint, come on. I'm not going to give you something for the sake of Allah. You have to give me money for that. Well, Sheikh Al-Bani is in the contrary. And then he says that, what as well made me go away from the Sufis, that Ahmed Kuftaro, he told us about a number of stories, mainly one of these stories that he said, that put me off from the Sufism. This Sheikh of mine, he says, that there was a Sheikh which is a Sufi, is to travel the land, and also claiming as well, it's an allegation, that he used to walk on the water. Okay? And then, there was a Murid. Murid is a devoted follower. A devoted follower that he will not even question anything. So he was to accompany him, but the Sheikh always refused for this person to accompany him. After assistance and after being insisting, the Sheikh had agreed for one condition. That is a condition, if you want to come with me, you have to obey me in everything. So when they came to the water, the Sheikh, he said to him, I'm going to say, Ya Allah. Ya Allah means, Oh Allah. And I will walk on the water. All, all of that, but by the way, is a story mentioned by Ahmed Kuftar the Sufi about, you know, alleged Sheikh Sufi. So I will say, Ya Allah, I will walk on the water. And you will follow me, but you say, Ya Shaykh, O Shaykh, O my Shaykh. So I would say what? Oh Allah, as a Shaykh. And this person would say, Oh my Shaykh, O my Shaykh. That means, my Shaykh, help me. And then you will walk just like me. So, when they went into the lake, as they have reached the middle of the lake, Shaytan came to whisper to that person who was the devoted follower, to whisper in his ears. He said, you are saying, you know, you are saying, oh Sheikh, but your Sheikh is saying, Ya Allah, why don't you just say the same thing, just like your Sheikh, Ya Allah, oh Allah. So as soon as he said, Ya Allah, he drowned in the water. And he started saying, oh Sheikh, oh Sheikh, help me. So his Sheikh came to him, started insulting him, and telling him off. He said, I said to you, don't just say Ya Sheikh, you're not fit enough to say Ya Allah. Your shaykh, your word, your dua, suppose, oh my shaykh, oh my shaykh. So the murid repented from that type of tawheed, and he came, God went back to say, oh shaykh, shaykh, and he was saved from the drowning. This is a Sufi story being given to the Sufi people, or I would say a naive story, whom the Sufi people believe. So tawheed is to say, ya Allah. Sorry, sorry, shirk is to say, ya Allah. Tawheed is today, oh Shaykh. Look at that, opposite, subhanAllah. So this Shaykh, uh, uh, Dr. Bani, he says, this, when I've heard it, and I've heard it so many times from my Shaykh, more than a hundred times, it put me off. And the Shaykh, Abdul Rahman Bani, every time he mentioned it himself, he just gets a stomach ache. And he is just so enraged. Okay, and even some tears come from his eyes. How can he be in that, in those days, be following such a man? who was deceiving uh, all these people. <clears throat> and that's how the Shaykh Abdul Rahman Bani had managed to go to the Salafiyya, alhamdulillah, after being convinced and upon knowledge. And every time he gathers, uh, when he talks to the people, he would mention his story with the Shaykh and the story of that Sufi man. And also you need to know that Shaykh Al-Bani, rahimahullah, when he wrote Kitab, Adab al-Zifat, and he wrote also the kitab, uh, which is Ahkam al-Janaiz, it was on the request of Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Bani. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Bani, he himself wanted to marry, so he asked the Sheikh to write a book. And he wrote Adab al-Zifat, which is a great book, from which the Sheikh uh, al-Jibali, Hamad al-Jibali, had written his book, which is Close as a Garment. It's all written from the Sheikh al-Bani's book, by the way. It's Sheikh al-Bani's book, but in a different the Sheikh al Bani's book, that Abu Zifaf, and Ahkam al Janais, it's a great book until today. It was, you could say, the greatest book regarding the funeral. Uh, and from that book as well, Sheikh Muhammad Jabal as well, he made funeral. It is actually the, but he added some, something there to do with the drawing of the, for example, the Lahd and so on and so forth, but it is the same book. It is as well, same book. And Sheikh Abdul Rahman Bani, he said, he told us before he died, just about before he died, died, by the way, in the 14th uh, of 11, 1431. Uh, he 
said, my, the virtues of Sheikh al-Albani upon me, the Al-Albani is saying that, that he had took me from the Sufiyah to the Salafiyah, and also made me know the importance of time. The time is very important, but also he taught me as well to be humble. The humbleness of the Sheikh al-Albani is amazing. We have talked about the paper, if you remember, that the Sheikh al-Albani had lost. And now we're going to talk about some of those shiyukh from Al Jazeera as well, who had said uh, their uh, as well uh, little stories, small stories, short stories about their meeting with the Sheikh al-Albani. We have Sheikh Salih al-Saymi, He is, he considers himself as well from of Sheikh al-Bani, as in he reads Sheikh al-Bani's book. But he was uh, one of these shiurs who used to write as well articles. Um, that is, he's not convinced with the Saturday fasting and also the uh, repeating the jama'ah uh, in the masjid after the jama'ah. So we have two issues where the Sheikh Salah uh, al used to uh, write to Sheikh al-Bani, you know, this is right and this is wrong and I, my opinion, this is so... Anyway, Sheikh Salah Hassan said, I paid a visit to Sheikh Al-Bani when he was in the hospital, just before he died, where his blood cells would change every two hours. You know, the blood cells had to be changed. That's why he died with Sheikh Al-Bani. has to be changed every two hours. So as soon as the Sheikh, Rahimahullah, and now Sheikh Salah Hassan is saying this in the Haram Medina, in the Haram of the Medina, he's saying in the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying the story. When I met the Sheikh, Sheikh Al-Bani uh, uh, was, you know, he saw him, he doesn't know him, but one of the people that was with him introduced, this is Sheikh Salih, this is Ustad Salih al Are you telling me about him? And the Sheikh Al-Bani is ill. Uh, he's the one who argues about the two points, he remembers it, which is to do with, you know, Tikrar al-Jama'ah, making the Jama'ah again, and regarding the issue of Salim al which is last Saturday. So, the Sheikh Sheikh Salim said, I said to the Sheikh, by the way, I'm still holding upon my opinion. So the Sheikh Al-Albani took hold of my hand. Sheikh Salim said, said that, took hold of my hand and he pressed it like this. He said, this is the way the student of knowledge should be. Never imitate a blind follow another person. And the Sheikh Salim said, he cried and he even made the people in the Haram to cry with him when he mentioned that story. He said, this is the student of knowledge should be. And he pressed his hand, he said, yes, that's what I want you to be. I don't want you to be, for example, just like a Sufi, Murid. He follows his Sheikh regardless. He has no question whatsoever. He's not allowed even to question. So he said, don't imitate me. and Don't imitate other than uh, others as well. Just follow what you think is correct according to the knowledge. Rahimahullah. Also, <coughs> uh, Sheikh Al-Halami, he could, you could say that he is the one who spent most of the time with the Sheikh, even on his own. Sheikh Al-Albani had never spent so much time on his own with somebody as much he has done with Sheikh Al-Halabi. Sheikh Al-Halabi, I don't want to shed light upon uh, his biography now, but when we try to maybe teach one of his books, that we will be maybe talking about his biography. Sheikh Al-Halabi, he tells us a story to talk about the patience this person has, which is Sheikh Al-Albani. Sheikh <coughs> Al Halabi, as I said, you could say the last few uh, months, um, Sheikh Al Halabi was on his own in the library of Sheikh Al Albani together with the Sheikh Rahimahullah. He says, When I made Umrah with the Sheikh, I was in a, in a car uh, which was behind the car of the Sheikh Al Albani, Rahimahullah, making Umrah. And going from Amman to the border, that's about, you could say, uh, 250 miles. All right? Before they reached the border, they reached a place called Amman. It's a city. So it's about, you could say, 180 miles. It's about 70 miles before the border. In Amman. That city. The Sheikh al Banis car stopped suddenly. So he said, we stopped as well behind him. He went to the Sheikh, what happened? What was wrong? Why are you stopping, Sheikh? He said, SubhanAllah. 
by the way, he was with his wife, his family. He said, I forgot my passport. I forgot the passport. They said, no problem, Sheikh. It's the masjid here. You stay in the masjid. We will go back and pick it up for you from the house. He said, no way. I'll do it myself. Sheikh, you're old man. Yeah, well, we will do it for you. He said, no, I will do it myself. Look at that. She doesn't like anybody to do his things. Apart from and I remember that. I wanted to he make, make a photocopy in his house. He said, do you know how to make a photocopy? I said, Sheikh, yes, I think so. They said, just do that and do that. And when he gave me instruction, I was shaking. So I, I made a message. Said, and he just left his bed, came, and he had to take the, make the photocopy himself. So I, I know that what the Sheikh is, he doesn't like anybody to do his things. Like the Prophet said, when his stick fell, he doesn't want one of the companions to pick it up. He went down himself to pick it up. The Prophet ﷺ wouldn't let some people to help him unless, like for example, when he wasn't him and Ali ibn Abi Talib and other companions, the three of them they have to take their turns on the camel. So when it comes to the turn, the Prophet ﷺ this mouse, he said, the Messenger of Allah, stay there and we will take that, you know, turn on you on your behalf. Are you in more need to the reward than myself? So he stepped the Prophet Sallam, are you in more need to the reward my, than myself? He stepped down the Prophet Sallam and Ali ibn Talib takes his turn and so on and so forth. So the Sheikh insisted to go and pick them up. <coughs> so he said to them, go to the borders and cross the borders and wait in a place called Tabuk. Tabuk is a first city that meets you after the borders of Jordan. So you, have, you make it possible, you go there. And it was, he says, Zuhr time. When that happened. So we said, Sheikh will go and come back. Maximum will find him coming back, crossing the border by midnight is maximum. Because from Dhuhr, the midnight is a lot of hours. So let's say it takes you about four hours to go, four hours to come back, passport, another two hours, ten hours. Ten hours, that's from, if it's 12 o'clock afternoon, so it will be what? 11, 12, 10 o'clock in there, just before midnight. <coughs> we waited. Midnight it didn't come. Fajr didn't come. So we didn't have mobile at that time. So we phoned the Sheikh's house and nobody's answering. And he had a, a neighbor, uh, which is a student, Sheikh Abdul Khadr, Abu Abdullah, who told you about his, uh, his short biography, his 40th son he had. You remember? Yeah. So they phoned Abdullah Azad Khadr. He said, you know, the Sheikh left and we don't, we don't know where he is and he's not answering. He said, don't worry, babe. Okay, I'll, I will just make sure what happened. So they went to the house. He went to the house. And then after a while, the Sheikh phones. Now, remember that this is taking place on Thursday. Okay, it's on what? On Thursday. So the following day is what? Friday. And by the way, that those days... We had only one day holiday, which is in the week, that is what? Friday. Now we have two days, Friday and Saturday. So the Sheikh, when he went, he says, so when he went to the house of the Sheikh, the Sheikh gave him a call. Gave him a call round about as well the whole time, phoned the, where they stayed, he phoned the place where Sheikh Al-Halabi was staying. And he said, what happened to you, Sheikh? He said, a word, I'm going to just quote it here, he said, أراد الله أن يعجم عود الألوان. الله سبحانه وتعالى he wanted to test شيخ ال to test the Alban. Allah wanted to test the Alban. He says that I took I went back and I took the passports. Me and my wife went all the way, crossed the Nile to the borders, put the passport to find out that the passports are expired. So went back all the way. From the borders to the house. And because it is Thursday, it's the end of the day is closed. So we have to wait until Saturday to what? Renew the passport. So wait or wait until Saturday. You could just go ahead if you want. So they will say we'll wait for the Sheikh. Now, how many miles he crossed the Sheikh in 48 hours? I calculated that. Okay. I would say, subhanAllah, it's uh, more than a thousand miles. More than a thousand miles. Huh? In less than 48 hours. And he's over 70 at that time. 
over 70 years old. It shows you the jalad. Jalad means a really impatient, very patient, the sheikh. Very so so patient. And everybody, when you talk about the sheikh, you know, how many hours is to stand on top of the ladder, huh? Reading a book. Six hours, he's on top of the ladder. And he's reading. Nobody would do that. Subhanallah. I mean, uh, if somebody else, what would he do? You know, maybe from the first, ah, oh, well, just forget about that. <laughs> if he went further, I mean, to go within the second time to say that the passport is being expired, he would say, Allah doesn't want me to make the Allah, let me go home. Would he do say that? But the Sheikh still insisted and he made the Allah. Rahimahullah. Now, the Sheikh as well, his eagerness for the da'wah. Sheikh Al Halabi says, I made the Hajj, it was the first Hajj for me, and it was the last Hajj of the Sheikh Al Halabi. It's like the farewell Hajj of the Sheikh. I'm to say farewell, farewell Hajj of the Prophet. But it was the last Hajj of the Sheikh, and it was the first Sheikh of Sheikh Al Halabi. And the Sheikh, <coughs> Rahimahullah, he was with the students of knowledge. And he was self-teaching, teaching all the time after Dhuhr, he says, and teach. After Asr, he says, and teach. After Mawr, he says, and teach. After Ish, he says, and teach. And in the Fajr as well, after Fajr, he says, and teach until about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Then he goes to just for a nap. Even when he goes to, they made him a room as well, a specific room for him. Even when he goes to the room, the people are coming, Zurafa, there will be lots of people coming. Two, three, four, ten people coming to his room to ask the Sheikh questions. So, I mean, subhanAllah, he's, he himself, he had sacrificed the whole of himself for the sake of the da'wah, rahimahullah. And the Sheikh, just before we had said goodbye to him on that, on the Hajj, he was staying with his daughter. So he said, inshallah, see you, inshallah, Sheikh, the Sheikh. He was saying, he lost his voice completely. Because if he did what? for talking and answering the question and giving the da'wah. One of the stories of the Sheikh says with the Sufis, I picked that up from one of the tapes, uh, it was, he said that the Sheikh, you know what we said, remember, we said and every month he would travel to a county in Syria to give da'wah. He said, I went to travel to Halab, Aleppo. Aleppo is not far away from Damascus. And uh, he gave the lecture, and after the lecture is finished, he said the people left except for four. Usually it is the ones who love the sheikh and love the da'wah. They would stay behind, talk to the sheikh and so on and so forth. He said, but I saw a person I've never seen him before. <coughs> and this person, he described to the sheikh, was too thin, but his stomach, his belly sticking out. So he's too thin, but his stomach is really up, you know, sticking out so much. And the Sheikh asked him, what is this? He said, Rahmaniyya. Rahmaniyya means mercy. He said, what is Rahmaniyya? Never heard the Sheikh never heard this word before. He said, Rahmaniyya. He said to him, Shish. And the Shish, that means Shish is Shish, is the Sikh, the, the rod. So it's, it's used for what? Poking rods into it. That's why it's big. He says, Shish. So he said, why did you come? And you come to the Salafi lecture, why did you come? He said, to show you our karamat. Karamat what? It's like our uh, 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 miracles, or other blessings Allah has given us. So he said to him, okay, I don't want you to bring me a shish. Okay. And then I just, and then he says, I all the time carry with me, like it's a, a, it's a sharpener, a pencil sharpener. But the pencil sharpener, not like these ones, the ones like, uh, it's like a, Scissors with two blades, each one pointed this way. You have seen them? So you put the pencil in between them and he sharpens it. It's a really little one. And before I go ahead, this is even his father, the Hanaf, you remember? When he came to Syria as well, to Damascus, he was challenging those people who are from the, from the Sufis with this type of scissors. So I used to, used to carry with me because of sharpening my pencil to write. So I said, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to use the rod. I'll just poke you with this. That's all. You have that little sharpener which has got the set. I could uh, draw it like this. I know these sharpeners because I've seen them before. Okay? So not, it's just like, like this. You put the sharpener in between. So it will be poking properly. So I just poke you with that. He said, 
my hand. She said, no, be it, my hand. <laughs> because you see, the Sheikh knows as well, that he will know where to hit it. There are some areas he knows. So she said, no, be it. So I said to him, you know, he's Sheikh because of his knowledge. He said, be it, my hand. I said, no, be it, be it, be it, be it, be it. The people surrounding, they were just looking at this word fluctuating from one person to another. Biyadi, biyadi, biyadi. Uh -huh. And he was a sheikh. I'm very patient because I am on the haq. I don't want to give up. So the man just so enraged gave up. So, so what is the difference? He said, if there's no difference, let it be mad. <laughs> what is the difference? If there is no difference, let it be mad. And he was baffled. <laughs> Do you understand that? Then he said, he wanted to change the subject now. Because he doesn't want it. Jesus said, Abu Ahmad, which is the owner of the house, bring the fire. So Shaykh al-Mani knows what he wants to ask. Abu Ahmad, don't bring the fire. Just bring me a piece of match. Matches, that's it. Around the fire. Bring the matches. So that person brought to bring the matches. He said to him, either you go back from this claim that you have, or I'll burn you. Shaykh is saying to him, or I'll burn you. He said, yeah, you can't burn me. And then the sh and he said, that man was really so scared. So he brought that match, he said, lit it up, he said, I'm going to burn you if you don't go back from what you claim. And he was just so scared, and anyway, he went to his Qadal uh, Imam, which is the white, they have white scarves. Okay? So he went to the Imam and he lit it up, the Sheikh. And the man, he couldn't do anything. So he said, maybe you're going to burn, so he just took it away and put it off in case he would go too much and would burn the man. And he said to him, go and tell your Sheikhs, this is the Karamat of Salafiyyim. Not Karamat Sufiyin, Salafi Karamat. Also, from the Sheikh, I will tell you that uh, story to tell you that the Sheikh, as well, he is, I would say, an inventor. Have you heard about inventor? He is an inventor. This person, I have seen, and when I went to go to the house, he's got a special thing that when he feeds this chicken, He's got pipes he made himself, okay, that while he's teaching, he just puts something, go down, down to the chicken and they will be fed. <laughs> All of it to save time. He's an inventor. But one of the things that Sheikh Al-Halabi mentions, which is amazing, <laughs> that he called for the carpenter. Uh, the carpenter for the wood, he called for the carpenter. He said to him, and it was the door, okay, this is the door, that goes to his what? library where he goes to his office to sit so he said to the carpenter the door opens like that i want the door open like this oh, no, no. door opens like that so the hinges are here i want it okay to open this way not that way this way the carpenter was puzzled why what for him you're going to be paying me money for, for, for what? what for? He just, do it and I will tell you later on. Just do it. And then, you know, he's baffled. He said, Why does she want to change it from this way to that way? So he changed it for him. Yeah, you know, he took the hinges from here and I have to cover the, you know, where the holes are and put the hinges here and then make it this side because actually it was opening, it was opening maybe that side. So he wanted to open this side. So after he had finished, he said, what is it for? He said, look. This door opened like this. Now his office, where his table is, that there, here. So if it opens like this, I need to go behind my desk. One, two, three, four, five steps. Opens at this. I'm coming behind my desk straight away. Two steps. I'm saving three steps coming in. Three steps coming out in five prayers. That's about 15, 25 steps. It's in about in a month. How many steps? How much time I'm saving? <laughs> Three steps coming in, three steps coming out, six steps. Five prayers, 30 steps. Because every prayer goes to the Maktaba. Every prayer comes out to pray and comes back. So he's saving time. Amazing. Rahimahullah. <laughs> in the Gulf War, in the Gulf War, in 1991, Sorry, the Christian days. Okay. <coughs> Where, you remember that the invasion of Kuwait to Iraq and then the invasion of America to okay, Iraq itself and what happened. There was a hadith. It was 
been given out and printed out to lots of people. Uh, this hadith is to do with the current situation. And uh, of course, the hadith wasn't authentic. But somebody bought it and wanted to do it. The, the, the khutaba has called it, saying it, the khatib is saying on the pulpit. So they came to the sheikh and wanted to check if this hadith, where is it coming from? So it was actually from Kanz al Umman, the Muntak al Hindi. And it was, it was narrated by Ibn Asakir in Tariq Dimash. Now, Tariq Ibn Dimash Ibn Asakir, which is Ibn Asakir as a scholar, he made a history for Damascus, for Gilad Shem. And that, that history, that, those books weren't printed at that time. Only four volumes were printed. Now these days we printed all of it, 80 volumes, 8-0, okay, only four volumes were printed. So the other, the other volumes were still as manuscript, you know what's a manuscript? Have you ever seen a manuscript? So the Sheikh now has to take that hadith and look for it in those manuscripts. Now those manuscripts, if you read one, I have to tell you, half a page you'll be sleeping. That's how difficult it is to go into the writings and... So the sheikh has to look for that hadith into those manuscripts, not in the four volumes we are printed. And Sheikh Al Halbi said, I used to inform the sheikh. Ah, sheikh, did you find the hadith? He said to him, Not yet, until five days. He said, I went to, I entered the his library, and I said to the sheikh, Have you found the hadith? So he just he said, looked at him with his glass and put it down. He said, Yes, walana mataimu juhala made it. Eyes of those ignorant never sleep. Huh? May the eyes of those ignorant people never sleep. Like when La Nama Ta'imul Jumana, La Nama Ta'imul Juhala. And he found it, and he found the chain of it is to be unauthentic. Last, you could say a story that we are watching. a story I just want to say that some of the biographies I have seen on the internet that such and such teacher or sheikh saying that they want to make biographies, uh, they want to talk about in their masjid about. The biography of some of the shiyukh, and namely, make a biography about Sheikh Ibn Baz, Sheikh Ibn Maithimi, and in Sheikh Al Bani. And it actually, uh, curiosity pushed me to go and listen to this. And I know they haven't got really much to add, just to listen um, to some which I don't think they would be praising the Sheikh. So I listened to this uh, lecture, it's supposed to be talking about the mirrors and the biographies of what Sheikh Al Bani. But in contrast of Sheikh Ibn Baz, they put it, mashallah, up and he's up, Sheikh Ibn Uthameen. So when it came to Sheikh Al-Bani, he said, just started saying that, you know, we have to make sure that when we mention the biography of such and such scholars, any scholar, we don't mention the things that are, that are common in between the scholars. We want to mention only that thing that would distinguish him. Very good, mashallah. So I was listening. First 20 minutes, nothing about Sheikh Al-Bani. Is to do with, you know, we should be mentioning this, and this is the right way of doing it, okay. And then Sheikh Al-Bani's, uh, uh, you could say, short biography, five to seven minutes. And then after the seven minutes, the last the 30 minutes, the rest of the lecture, is to do with those hadiths which he himself does not agree, or those points or opinions of Sheikh Al-Bani he does not agree upon, and to refute all these people, why they following the Sheikh Al-Bani. This is not a biography of the Sheikh. This is just an envy, a person that's envy of the Sheikh because his fatawa had flew and spread whether he likes it or not amongst the people. Huh? So much that the people will, now these days, they would say, Sahahahu Sheikh al If this hadith wasn't, you didn't mention it, Al-Albani made it authentic, they would not even take it. Whether they like it or not. So whether they like it or not, the enemy or not the enemy, they have to know that Sheikh Al-Albani is the mujaddid of the hadith of this era. Beyond any doubt. So those people, and I'm, I'm just really uh, telling you, uh, please, when you, for example, don't be deceived by the title of the lecture to say that this is a Sheikh Al-Albani's uh, biography. Maybe it is not. It's actually, for example, this person was talking about the issue of Sheikh Al-Albani, talking about covering the face of a woman. You know that the Sheikh, Rahimahullah, said that the covering of the face of a woman is not to be compulsory. And he says that if her husband, the husband of a wife, or the father of the daughters, had said to them to cover them, it becomes compulsory because of the obedience to the husband or the guardian or the father. But as it is, it is not compulsory. And the Sheikh had made a lot of a number of books 
uh, and a uh, uh, number of articles, and he had as well a number of lectures regarding this issue. And I have no doubt myself that this is not really compulsory, but as I said, it will, Sheikh Al-Bari says it's recommended. It's recommended as well for women. But to force a life with, with, to say that this is what the Prophet ﷺ imposed upon us, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have no proof whatsoever to support such an argument. And then he talks about the issue of uh, when the person comes in, that Prophet ﷺ, he dislikes anybody to stand up for him. This person says, Mikhail al-Mali says that, but he doesn't know that it is now these days that if a person comes in uh, like an old man and you are sitting, you don't stand up for the sake of him, that would cause harm and so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, you need to, by the way, make sure that we understand two things. There is one thing, which is that there is a difference between not applying a sunnah for the sake of bringing the hearts together or <coughs> making something, doing something which is already prohibited for the sake of bringing the hearts together. I mean, no problem if there is something that is sunnah, a new sunnah, that the people may uh, say this strange one, it will bring hatred, it will bring conflict, it will bring you know, chaos, that this sunnah not to be implemented except slowly, slowly. But to compromise your religion, and this is one of the words that we have used to learn from the Shaykh. دَارِهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي دَارِهِمْ أَرْضِهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي أَرْضِهِمْ وَحَيِّهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي حَيِّهِمْ وَلَكِنْ لَيْسَ عَلَى حِسَابِ الشَّيَّةِ That is, دَارِهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي دَارِهِمْ دَارِهِمْ means, <coughs> overlook their, okay, their stakes, as long as they are, overlook. Take it easy on them. دَارِهِمْ And take it easy on them. Treat them as like kids, that they are ignorant. As long as you are in their dar. Dar means what? House. But it doesn't work in English. It's an Arabic only works. And أَرْضِهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي أَرْضِهِمْ Please them as long as you are in their land. أَرْضِهِمْ means please them. مَا دُمْتَ فِي أَرْضِهِمْ As long as you are in your أَرْضِ أَرْضِ means land. وَحَيِّهِمْ مَا دُمْتَ فِي حَيِّهِمْ And greet them well as long as you are in their حَيِّ حَيِّ means as well as like a locality. But don't compromise the Sharia. So I remember one day, I brought one Imam who was going to be an Imam and you know that the people who are in, uh, in most of the Arab lands, the ones who are, for example, the Imam is reciting a verse that contains sajda, sujud tilawa, that the Imam usually would say Allahu Akbar and would prostrate. And when he gets up as well, we say what? Allahu Akbar. But the Shaykh al-Albani's opinion, which is based upon the hadith, that there is no Allahu Akbar to go down, and there's no Allah but to go up. But this Imam now is going to be leading the prayer in a masjid which the previous Imam before him, he got the news to say, Allahu Akbar, he goes down after sujood and Allah Akbar, he gets up. But I said to that Imam, you should not do that now. You should do that slowly. He did not listen to me. I said, okay, I'll leave the Shaykh. And he will talk to you. And I didn't know what the Shaykh was going to tell him. So the Shaykh took him on a sign and said, Ali bin Nasr sunnah bin sunnah. Teach the people the sunnah in a sunnah. That means easy. So for example, first of all, explain to them what is the right etiquette when you prostrate for sujood tilawah. That is, you recite a verse contains sajda. What is the etiquette from the Prophet ﷺ? Then when you now then recite a surah in your recitation, in your prayer, where it contains sujood tilawah, then you tell them that, for example, it is not compulsory to what? To prostrate. So you don't prostrate. Second time, when you prostrate, you do Allahu Akbar and Allahu Akbar to get up. Two Allahu Akbar. Second time, because you made a lecture, make Allahu Akbar when you go down, but remove the Allahu Akbar when you go up. Third time, remove Allahu Akbar when you go down, and Allahu Akbar when you go up. Bit by bit by bit. This is how the people will like it. This is to apply the Sunnah. But if there's something prohibited from the Prophet ﷺ, from Allah Azzawajal, you may not do it for the sake of what? Bringing the heart together. Because when I prohibit you, then keep away from it. And what I command you to do, do it as much as you are capable of doing it. But prohibition, you have to stop straight away. So when the Prophet وسلم, he had forbidden a person to stand up for another person, he said, من أراد أن يتمثل له الناس قياما فليتبوأ مقعده من النار. This person who likes the people to stand up as soon as he comes in, then let him prepare himself a seat in the hellfire. Look at that. And not only that, لا يقيمن الرجل الرجل. The 
person should not make the other person to stand up. But you know, make you know, make it uh, sort of there's a room for the people to sit down. There's a room to sit down. Now the hadith which they're using, which that person which I'm going to hear him to use, was he's using the hadith of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, radiyallahu anhu wa rabbah. You know in the battle of the trench, he was hit by an arrow. And that arrow hit him in his arm, and there was gushing blood. But he had made a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if, uh, just to Allah, so just to save him, until he gives his verdict regarding Banu Quraida, because the Jews of those, uh, of those uh, tribe had betrayed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle of the trench. When Sa'd ibn Mu'adh came, and he was on his camel, so the Prophet sallallahu he told his people on the house, he told them, Kunu ila sayyidikum fa'zilu. Stand up for the sake of your master to dismount him. Why? Because he's what? In hit. Now there is a difference in Arabic between kumu ila and kumu li. Kumu ila that means stand up to get him down. Kumu li sayyidah means sign of what? Respect. Respect. Stand up for the sake of him. Ila and li. It's in Arabic, very important. Ila and li. And he said in the hadith, Ila sayyidikum fa'anzilu. And dismount him. Not kumu li sayyidikum, sayyidikum for the sake of that he's a master. And by the way, this thing that takes place now these days, you know for a fact, when somebody is worthwhile, is a sheikh, comes into a <coughs> gathering, everybody's standing up for him for the sake of shaking his hand. But if it's a person who is like, let's say, the coffee maker, if he comes in, nobody bothers. So this shaker of the hand, standing up for the person, because you, everybody wants to stand up to give him the place, is because he's what? Known. So it will create a split into the community. The person who has got high rank, he will get um, you know, the middle of the gathering. He will give him the best of seats. Whereas the person who is a coffee maker, floor sweeper, nothing. Even though the floor sweeper is closer to Allah than that person who is claiming to be a sheikh or so on and so forth. So the Prophet wasallam, he is the one that we think the most deserved person if you want to stand up, to stand up for him. And as he says, he said, we never see anybody worth to stand up for him more than the Prophet wasallam, but we never did that for him because we used to know that he used to hate that. Not just hate, hate it too much. You say it is too much that a person stand up for the Prophet uh, after this, just to tell you that from the students of Sheikh Al Albani, from previous Sheikhs, we have Muhammad Eid Abbasi, uh, uh, the one who had made a book called Bid'ah Al Asr Al Madhabi. If you have that book, please grab it. It was in English, I don't know. Read it, it's about that thick. It's about volume of that thickness. Bid'ah Al Asr Al Madhabi talks about the innovation of the blind following in which he brings all of those stories which I mentioned for you regarding who leads the prayer, if you remember, the one who's got the biggest head, the one who's got the most beautiful one, the one who's got the shortest thing, you know, all of those stories in that. And where the, for example, the Ahnaf, they were fighting with the Shafi'is to the extent that they said that if it was for me, I would have taken tribute from the Shafi'i, tribute the Jizya, uh, treat them like disbelievers. Uh, so all of that you find it in the book of Sheikh Muhammad Iyad Abbasi. From the students as well, from Sheikh Al-Bani, rahimahullah, we have Sheikh Mashur as well, Hafizahullah. He is one of the scholars that is in Jordan at the moment. Uh, he used to be uh, at the beginning of his life with the Ikhwan. And then he left the Ikhwan knowing that they are not upon the Haq. And he started uh, following the Sheikh, rahimahullah, da'wah. And as I said, we've already shed light about this Sheikh. It will take us lots of lectures, but so, so inshallah, we'll, we'll satisfy ourselves with this. So let's go to the book, and I'll just make an, uh, the first introduction for you to get the book, first of all. The book is in Arabic and English in PDF file. The book is a, uh, talks about al-tasfi wa tarbiya These are the two main pillars that the Sheikh al-Bani used to talk about all his life. Tasfi wa tarbiya purification and cultivation. Purification, tasfi and tarbiya cultivation bring it up. And the Shaykh had made this lecture in Amman, in Ma'had al-Shari'i, in the Shari'i, which is a religious polytechnic. And about 40 years ago, the Shaykh starts 
with as follows. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruh, wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati a'malina, man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lah, wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به الأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوضا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. Now this is the Sheikh Albani. I would say the revival of this khutbah which we call it khutbah al-Hajj, the addressing of need, where the Sheikh رحمه الله had revived the Sunnah which has been left for a long time. People, they don't pay attention to it. The Messenger of Allah, whenever he makes a marriage ceremony, he would start with this. Whenever he makes a khutbah for Friday or a class or whatever uh, admonishing, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he would start with this. The Sheikh had made a book for this a booklet called Khutbat al Hajat. A little booklet, I think it's been translated into English, I think. Khutbat al Hajat. <coughs> then this khutbah. The dressing of need. So you need the uh, hearts of the people, say this khutbah. You need uh, to achieve uh, a proper marriage, a good marriage, and that this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this marriage, say this khutbah. Now, uh, some of the scholars, or some of the students of knowledge will say, it is not all the time we should be, you should not be sticking with this all the time. Well, first of all, if we are in an era, we are that the people saying this khutbah, yeah, we don't mind, for example, a person says, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, and then he makes up, you know, a khutbah, khutbah. But the thing is that we're not in that era. We are in an era at the moment that the people, they don't pay attention to this khutbah. They bring, if you listen to the some of the khatibs, their own words, they make them like a poet, and they say it every week. Where do you get it from? And we know for a fact that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Utitu jawami al -kari. I have given the words which are collective. Words that small or few in numbers, but vast in meaning. So if it is the case, why do you stick to your own words? And they like it as well. They make it like you know, poetry. So why do you, and you keep saying it all the time. Stick to the word of Sayyid al-Musari. He is the most eminent, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't mind if he said once this and that, but it is most of the time they say, other than this khutbah al-Hajjah, the addressing of me. And this is the first point. Second point, we find some people, Jazakallah khayyam, sticking to this khutbat al-hajjah, but they add to it. Like for example, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nasta'adi. The word wa nasta'adi, where is it coming from? Though? From your pocket. Keep what is in your pocket in your pocket. And say what the Prophet ﷺ said. Because the Messenger of Allah, utiya jawami al -kari. It is like as well when you pray. You say, رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ Some people say, رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ وَالشُّكْرُ جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيَّرُ Where do you get the shukr from? The shukr, where did it come from? Because he's heard somebody else saying. So he would say, شُوفِيهَا What's wrong? <coughs> shukr. With this, شُوفِيهَا What do you mean شُوفِيهَا? This is religion. You can't add something unless you have a proof from Allah and His Messenger. These are the words of Allah. These are the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, we say to the brothers, Allah khairan for saying this khutbah, but don't add to it. Okay? And, <coughs> as well, they say, so, inna alhamdulillah, that is all praises you to Allah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'firu, which is the khutbah al hajjah started with, indeed, all praises to Allah, we praise Him, seek His aid and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves, or from the evils of our actions. From so Allah, Guides, none can misguide. And whom of Allah leads astray, none can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah alone. And I bear witness Muhammad, Muhammad is a slave and a messenger. Now, 
Some people say, Ya ayu aladina amanu, which is the Surah Ali Imran. This verse in Surah Ali Imran. Ya ayu aladina amanu, you who believe, fear Allah should be feared, and they not accept in the state of Islam. They would say, Qala Allah, ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, Ya ayu aladina amanu. Allah had said, after saying, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. How did Allah say, A'udhu min ash-shaytan rajim? Do you understand? Allah has said, after A'udhu billahi, Allah is saying, Allah is making second refuge in himself from the shaytan. Did you understand the word? They keep saying it is in the khutbah. قال الله بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. Brothers, this is wrong way of doing it. He said, قال الله, and he said the verse. And then after the verse, he says, صدق الله. صدق الله العظيم. Well, it means Allah said the truth. Yeah, Allah said the truth whether you like it or not. You don't have to say that. And especially as well when they finish the recitation of the Quran, صدق الله العظيم. And they say this one more melody. صدق الله. Yes? Or something, I'm like, where is he getting from, brother? Prophet didn't say Sadaq Allah. <coughs> it's a verse, but it's Sadaq Allah, yes, the verse. But you can't end a verse with that. Sadaq Allah. So, Ya Yu Aladina Aman, O you who believe, fear Allah Shafi. This is Ali Amr. And then he goes to the second one without saying A'udhu bin Muhammad Rajim, which is in Surah Nisa. He says, Ya Yu Hannas, O you, O people, it taqwa rabbakum, fear Allah, be your Lord. And the khalaqakum min nafsin wahida, the one who created you from a single person. No problem to, if you are doing it in English, explain. Single person was that Adam. And from him he created his wife, that is Hawa. And from them both he created many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and do not cut the relations of your relatives. Surely Allah is ever the one who told you. This is Surah Al Nisa, verse number one. Then the third verse Ya Yuwa Ladina Amanu Taqullah, Surah Al Ahzab. O you who believe, fear Allah. Waqulu Qawlan. And speak always the truth. Yuslah lakum a'malakum. He will rectify. That is, he will rectify your situation and he will forgive your sins. And he will so ever obeys Allah and his messenger had indeed achieved an immense great achievement. What is that achievement? He will be saved from the hellfire and he will be a to the paradise. Amma ba, to proceed. The best of talks, Kalamullah. Prophet said Kalamullah. So he then said Kalamullah Ta'ala. Do you me? Just stick to that word. خير فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور مهدلاتها and that is to proceed right in the best of talk the best talk of the book of Allah the sayings of Allah the speech of Allah and the best of guidance and guidance of His Messenger may peace and blessings be upon him and really the most evil of all matters are the ones innovated for every new innovated matter is innovation and every innovation is in His guidance and every in His guidance and the help are this is as I said in a booklet of Sheikh Al Bani رحمه الله in which he will tell you from where those comes from, the sources of those from Muslims, Sahih Muslim and so on so forth. And then the Shaykh starts and this will be inshallah next week. We will start with that because I wanted to have the book. And I, if you don't have the book, it will not be, uh, it will be somebody inshallah as well reading for me. I will read in Arabic, somebody will read in English and inshallah go ahead with it. Okay? Do you have any questions? E-book. The PDF form. The PDF, yeah. PDF form. Brothers can take the USB sticks and get it. Where? From, from, from the bookshop. From the bookshop. You want your stick? It's waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll just wait inshallah before we leave. Give 10 minutes and then we'll finish. Any questions on the side? Father. <coughs> Accident. This is another issue that we have really as well to discuss. We find that some of the khatib on their pulpit, when they mention the verses regarding the khutbah al-hajjah, they start making them with their melody, like with their recite in the Quran tajweed. This is not from the sunnah. Uh, we don't have the sunnah to support that, so we say them as we are reading. That is, Ya ayyuhal nas, taqwa rabbakum, alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahid, like that. But to read them a melody, it is not from the sunnah, and we haven't heard from the sunnah. So the Prophet used to make tajweed while he was doing them in the Khutbat al Haja. Allah Ta'ala. Now, Tafadl. Is it okay to read the first section? Very good question. It is the word, the Prophet in a number of occasions as well, he would just start with, Inna alhamdulillah, skip the verses and then go straight away, Amma ba'afa inna 
So no problem. This is the full version I've given you. So no problem. And as I said, no problem to give as well. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Which I do sometimes in my classes. But as I said, we are an era that we have to make a wake up call for the people that this is the sunnah, how to start your lecture. Especially in, in, in some environments, uh, that when I went to some of the countries, they don't really use this khutbat al hajj whatsoever. Whatsoever. They never used it. And as I said, Sheikh al-Albani had to revive it. Hamidah, rahimahullah. Now, we'll start. Doctor. Could, uh, could you just remind us about the benefits of this hadith, how it blesses and protects from mistakes, something like that? Khutbat al hajj if somebody... Khutbat al hajj is addressing your need. The person who he says it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him what he needs. So what are you need? What are my after now? The reconciliation of the hearts and everybody that will become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you are doing a marriage, the Prophet would do this al Hajjah. Because what you're after? That a successful marriage. That a husband and a wife that will be upon the Sharia, upon the path of uh, Haq, alhamdulillah. That's what it means. Now, go to the left hand side. We're almost finished. Oh, yes, Sheikh Sahih Sahih. Now, um, what's the stronger opinion that you can do the demand, a second demand in the masjid mm -hmm. or you can't? Right. The uh, opinion of Sheikh Sahih Sahih, which is an opinion of Ibn Hazm before him as well, which is an opinion of one of the sons of Sheikh <coughs> Imam Ahmad bin Hanbar, rahimahullah. But the scholars who are Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam al Shafi'i who are playing tennis match, huh? they got three games one. <laughs> but we're not playing tennis match. That if it is the case, the, the three scholars, they say it is forbidden to <coughs> repeat a jama'ah in a masjid where the prayer has been prayed. Um, if you understand what is the reason, then you will understand why. First of all, we have from Anas radiallahu anhu, he says, كَانَ الصَّحَابَةُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا دَخَلُوا مَسْجِدًا سُلِّيَ فِي صَلُّ فُرَاتِ The companions of the Prophet وسلم, whenever they enter a masjid where the prayer, that is the main jama'ah, has been established, they will pray in single form. They will not make another jannah. Shafi'i says, I dislike. I dislike here for forbiddings. I hate. I hate for Imam Shafi'i. He's like haram. That is when the Imam had finished the jama'ah, people start making another jama'ah because they will split, split the kalima, split the unity of the Muslims. When they are behind one Imam saying ameen, rather than to split that ameen to have it more than ameen, and especially if the Imam is disliked by some people. So these people would deliberately go late to make their own Jama'ah. Or especially if that person he likes his own voice and he wants the people to hear his voice. So in Maghrib wa Shafi'ah, he would delay himself deliberately to start a new Jama'ah where he could show his voice. Well, lots of things would happen from this. And the strongest proof for this, I'm not going to give you this proof which is the city, which is the proof of that is of Anas, about the companions. I'm not going to give you as well the proof of Abdullah the Prophet said he himself arrived late and he did not make the jama'ah with his uh, with the companions there in the masjid he went to his wives. And I'm not going to give you the proof of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he came with his two students when the prayers finished he went home and he made jama'ah with them. But I'm going to give you from Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih muslim where the hadith of the Prophet said he says in the salawat al the most difficult prayer upon the hypocrites and the hypocrites here that hypocrisy which is the major one but as well it could be as well as minor ones the ones who are not proper muslim that is al-fajr wal isha salat al-fajr prayer of the fajr prayer isha and his prophet said i almost commanded a person so the prayer to be established the call of the prayer to be on allah akbar allah akbar they come and they will command a person to lead the prayer. Anybody to lead the prayer. And I will go with a bunch of people, group of people, or they will have wooden stick with them. That is, I will burn the houses of those people who does not, who do not witness, do not join the jama'ah. I will burn their houses because they did not come to the jama'ah. Now I am asking in this hadith, which jama'ah he refers to? If there was uh, a green light for more than jama'ah, 
do you think this hadith will be functioning? He was going to burn this house. The person said, Messenger of Allah, I, I, I will go to the Jama'ah, number 51, inshallah. <laughs> because if you say 51, Jama'ah is not right. There is, in, if you go to region Patmos, from Zuhur to Asr, Jama'ah, after Jama'ah, after Jama'ah, after Jama'ah. Jama and if you go during the summer, more than 100 Jama'ah between Zuhur and Asr. Because the summer between Zuhur is a long time. Jama'ah, so the Prophet of Allah, I'm going to the Jama'ah number 22, 25, 27. So there will be no, 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 no use for this hadith. There will be Jama'ah for the Jama'ah. He meant the first Jama'ah. That's what he meant. And the Prophet of Allah, he said, لَقَدْ مَا حَزَرَتْكُمْ يَهُونَ أَكْثَرَ مَا حَزَرَتْكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَمْرَيْنَ That the Jews never had envied you, more than had envied you, except that on, on two things. That is what? Number one, Salam. Salamu alaykum, Salamu alaykum. Number two, Ameen. And how can you have a powerful Ameen when you have one Jama'ah? But we're going to make it okay, one Jama'ah, more than Jama'ah, and then there will be no powerful Ameen. The proof that the Ibn Hazm brings, or from Imam Ahmad, which is the same proof, and which is Sahih Shaykh Sahih Ismiz, depending on that is the hadith of the Prophet, which is hadith authentic. That when the Prophet finished his prayer, and a person entered. So the Prophet after he looked at him, and he had some companions with him. Of course, Abu Bakr and Umar, they would be there. So he said, Ala min rajulin Let a man, and a man he had been single for, make charity, sadaqah, charity, on this man. Now if we discuss this hadith, and in its context, number one, we know that the companions were all the time eager to come to the what? The jama'ah. They never miss it, because the jama'ah of the Prophet ﷺ. Number two, this is an incident. It's not being repeated, which is a person came in, but yet we we'll still discuss that incident. We don't say this is just hal uh, hal No, it's not. Number three, if there was good into that jamaah, do you think that the companions will not do it? If the companions will not even join that man? We have another hadith that Abu Bakr stood and gave him the prayer. He led him in the prayer. So Abu Bakr was playing what? Voluntary, while that person praying what? Compulsory. So if there was any good in it, why not just Omar joins in, Uthman joins in, and do another jama'ah? And that's Abu Bakr, who had prayed already with whom? Prophet And that's where Sheikh Al-Bani says something which the scholars before him did not mention there. That is, Sadaqah. Sadaqah means charity. What is charity? From the rich to the poor. And the person who prayed the jama'ah is the rich. And the one who did not pray the jama'ah is what? The poor. That's the ishtiyad of Shaykh al in that issue. But it's obvious that we could see there's only Abu Bakr. Two people are praying and nothing more. We see now, now it's not two people. So the Shaykh al doesn't say, for example, it's forbidden to make uh, jama'ah whatsoever in the masjid after the jama'ah. As long as you don't understand what is the wisdom and the theme behind it. So the wisdom is that number one, that is, we're not going to give a hint that it's okay to give jama'ah to belittle diminish the importance of the first jama'ah. If, for example, travelers came, outsiders, and the masjid is finished the jama'ah, can they make jama'ah? Yes! I'm not saying anything wrong. Why? Because that jama'ah they're going to make is not going to give the hint or indication to the people that these people are repeating jama'ah. As soon as they come in, oh, the new people, they came, travelers, and new faces, no problem. But it's you lots who come to the customers of the jama'ah. Uh, you start coming late and making your own jama'ah. That's where we say that's wrong. No problem if you take yourself and go upstairs, not here. Uh, to a corner from, or maybe to the shop or something. But as long as you don't make it where the main jama'ah takes place. <coughs> this is to make sure that the people, when they miss the jama'ah, they miss something important. If there's lots of jama'ah, I don't care. 25th jama'ah, I'm coming, inshallah. I don't care. But if he misses the jama'ah, commiseration will come there. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. It's like you have, you have lost somebody, died. You, so if you have more than jama'ah, you're not going to feel that, would you? But you have one jama'ah, oh, I lost it, oh, I lost the jama'ah. But if you have more than jama'ah, the person in the shop, I'm waiting, inshallah. I like the person who recites in the seventh jama'ah. His recitation is nicer. But that's happening. That's happening because his voice is better. I'll wait for him, inshallah. I don't like the imam. Look at that. And this is how I've seen a person... We're coming to the masjid, 
Masjid al Hussein. And the Imam is in the main Jama'ah, but he was in the last Tashahur. He's about to say what? Salam. So I'm about to join. Huh? To join. I've seen people saying to others, he didn't say to me because maybe he's scared because of the beard. Huh? So you see to other people, want to join? <laughs> we don't join. It's finished. Finish. Let's make our own jama'ah. <laughs> because it's finished, why should you just join that little bit? You start from the beginning, but I feel. I didn't say to me, see to somebody else. Now we're going to have last question, please. Last question. You have to ask a question. You have to ask a question. Yes. No, no, you two, yes, together. Salatul uh, Khairun Minan Nam in the Fajr's Azhar. Is it the first Adhan or the second Adhan? Salatul Khairun Minan Nam. Is it the first Adhan or the second Adhan? First of all, this is one of the very controversial issues. It's exactly like reciting Al Fatiha behind the Imam who is reciting Fatiha in the loud recitation, Maghrib and Rashid. It's exactly the same. Controversial. And we could see that there is a powerful, strong dealing with both as well parties. Really strong. But if we investigate it closely, we could see that uh, there is, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm telling you now, by the way, Al Haram, Mecca, Medina, they do it, Salatul Khairul Nam, the second of them. Okay? That we have two things here to look at. Uh, so number one, Salatul Khairul Minan Nam, these are not from the words of the Adam. The Adam, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. That is, prayer is better than sleeping. By prayer, better than sleeping. These are not words from the, from the Adhan. <coughs> so, that's number one. So that means the Adhan which is indicated in the beginning of a time of a prayer, those words should not be there. Because they're not part of the Adhan. And number two, we have Hadith Abi Mahdur. One, Abu Mahdur is one of the Mu'adhineen of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's got an amazing story as well when he embraced Islam. He's got a nice voice. When, and that is why he was the Mu'adhine of the Prophet of Allah in Mecca. Bilal and Abdullah ibn Maktoum was in Medina. So Abu Mahdura, Prophet Sallallahu said to him, when you make the adhan of the Fajr, Bil Awwal, he said, mention it, the first, the first, then say, which we call it Tathweep, Salatu Khayyur bin Nawm, Salatu Khayyur bin Nawm. Because of that wording, which is authentic, is Sunan al Nasai, and it's authentic, so we say it is to say, As Salatu Khayyur bin Nawm, in the adhan, which is nothing to do with the indication of the starting of the prayer, but it's actually to prepare you for the prayer that is to say it in the first Adam. But we respect the other opinion as well, who says to say it in the second Adam. As I said, they've got as well a proof for themselves. So, but if you ask me, I would say, it's my masjid, my masjid. But anyway, with our masjid, we don't have a first, a person come before that. We have, we have be having one to come in the Fajr itself, to have somebody coming before Fajr, you know. <laughs> سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله